There is a time and a place for everything. The fasted versus fed training argument is generally one that is had based on ego, not necessarily on fact, or breaking down when you want a desired outcome. There is a time and a place. We have to look at performance versus adaptation. So this will be the last video you probably ever have to watch on fasted training versus fed training because we're gonna break down performance, fat oxidation, we're gonna break down peak power, we're gonna break down anaerobic versus aerobic, and we're gonna have some answers. Let's go ahead and break it down. First, we're gonna look at a study that was published in the Scandinavian Journal of Medicine and Sports and Science. Okay, this looked specifically at longer duration and shorter duration aerobic work. Now, I know what you're thinking. I'm more worried about resistance training. I don't care about aerobic. We have to lay a foundation. I promise you this is very, very important. So it took a look at short duration and long duration in fed states and fasted states. And what they ultimately found within this paper was that it didn't really matter whether you were fasted or fed until the exercise became quite prolonged. What does that mean? Well, first off, let me say that this was a study that looked at 46 studies. This wasn't any small little bit of data. This was large scale meta-analysis. Okay? And essentially what it means is that it doesn't matter when you're doing a 30 minute or 45 minute bout of exercise, if you're fast or fed. It's not gonna change your performance a whole lot, if any. But what they did notice is that once you start getting into these longer, longer duration things, that's when fueling does actually seem to matter. And personally, I've done some pretty ridiculous, kind of egregious things in a fasted state. And what I found is that when I get to that like three, four hour mark, yeah, it doesn't matter how fat adapted I am, I need some fuel. And generally it needs to be some carbohydrates because the demand for fuel just starts to overpower my rate at which I can create glucose through other mechanisms like gluconeogenesis. So let's put that aside for just a second. And let's look at the other side. What they found with the fasted group is that there was a higher prevalence of circulating free fatty acids, which implies that there's more fat burning, but it doesn't necessarily mean it. Because you're having, well, it does mean it, but it doesn't mean you're losing fat per se, right? Because a lot of things come into the equation. But there was an increase in circulating free fatty acids, which means that fat was being mobilized, which makes sense because you don't have carbs in the way to be burned first. But what they did find is that there was a stronger adaptation in a fasted group. So what they found is that feeding seemed to blunt the skeletal muscle and the adipose signaling and ultimately resulted in less mitochondrial adaptation. What does that mean in English? It means that when you work out, you trigger an adaptation because of a stressor. Okay, feeding seemed to improve performance a wee bit but it did come at a cost of less adaptation. And I'm gonna come back to this theory in a second, but it's much like training with a weight vest, okay? So it's like you train, it's hard with a weight vest, and take the weight vest off, it's easier and you can perform better. But what's getting you more adaptation versus actual number on the scoreboard? We have to break this down more because we're being very, very thorough here. Okay, let's look a little bit more at aerobic before we get into anaerobic, okay? One study took a look at high glycemic versus low glycemic carbs, which by the way, no difference between the two when it came to training, anywhere from 45 minutes to four hours before a workout. And what's interesting is this almost implies that anything beyond four hours is probably considered a fasted workout for all intents and purposes. May not be like overnight fast, but probably have enough fuel drain that you could consider it a fasted or semi-fasted workout. Out of all the studies that they looked at, 11 of them found that there was a smidge better performance if there were some carbohydrates, low or high glycemic, before a workout. But 14 studies found no difference. So when you look at lots of data, the majority actually says there's actually not much difference in performance. However, we're not looking at peak power. We're looking at just kind of general performance here. So let's do that. Let's look at maximum power during a workout. Like that actually matters. So there's a study that was published in the journal Sports Science that was quite interesting with this. And it found that when subjects were fed with carbohydrates pre-workout versus no carbohydrates pre-workout, there was quite a difference. Now when we look at this, the difference was in maximum wattage, maximum power. The carbohydrate-fed group had an average high wattage of 346 
compared to 332. Now, when you look at large amounts of data, that's actually a big difference between the averages. So you do seem to get more wattage. If you were to go just hammer on like an assault bike or something for like 20, 30 seconds, like just that high like push, or maybe even 60 seconds, because we're a little more aerobic, having some carbs in your system is gonna get you a little more wattage. But here's where the caveat comes in. Fat oxidation was significantly lower at 0.33 versus 0.46. So is the increase in performance worth the decrease in fat oxidation? I want you to ponder something for just a second here. The argument is generally that, hey, who cares if you're oxidizing more fat if you're ultimately burning less calories? Because it is calories in, calories out, right? Well, yes, but let's pretend for something for a second. Let's pretend both people burn 1,000 calories. One has an increased fat oxidation, one does not. Well, arguably, the one that has more fat oxidation at 1,000 calories is going to be burning more of that fuel from body fat as fat. So that's kind of an interesting argument to have. You're essentially burning more fat. But then we have to bring into the equation, like, OK, you're unable to push as hard. So perhaps the amount of calories that you're burning in absolute is less. But it seems as though the absolute amount of calories that you burn is not significant enough to offset the fat oxidation. So it kind of comes down to like what feels best. But now we have to understand more. We need to look at anaerobic. What about peak power when it comes down to explosiveness or anaerobic activity, resistance training, power lifting, these things that matter to your body composition and your performance. But before we get specifically into anaerobic, let's understand adaptation a little bit too. Adaptation is almost like your fitness. I view adaptation as like the fitness, like how you're growing, how you're adapting, how much more fit you're getting versus just a number on the scoreboard. So a lot of times your peak performance and your fitness are not necessarily translating to one another proportionally. So like you can have phases where you focus on performance and phases where you focus on adaptation. Here's a study that kind of makes some sense out of this. This study was published in the journal Science and Sports and Medicine, and it had subjects train four times per week for five weeks, and it had them do this in a fasted versus a fed state. What they essentially found here is that in the fasted group, there was a greater improvement of VO2 max. There was also a greater improvement of glycogen concentration. Now by improvement, that means a greater leap. So they did have a greater adaptation. So from baseline to overall just improvement, there was more improvement in a fasted group than there was in a fed group. Why is this? Because you're signaling for adaptation because you're in more of a stressed state, not performance mode. Training is about training. Performance is about game day, if you want to put it like that. Interesting thing about this study is that feeding did increase the time to exhaustion. They were able to go longer. They were able to go farther. But it comes again, like, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to have every day be a win? Or are you having adaptation? What do you want? So let's jump over to anaerobic for a second, in which case we look at three things that are very important. The creatine phosphate system, okay, your available ATP, and, of course, glycolysis, like actually using carbs as energy. Now, side note, something regardless of what you are doing, creatine is very important. And if you're worried about decreasing performance during your like, bouts of fasted training, especially with power exercises, one of the best things you could do is increase your creatine stores because that's going to be what gives you that initial power and initial recovery in many, many ways. I did put a link down below for one of our sponsors. This video is not dictated by this sponsor, but it is a relevant placement and it's something that might help you out. It's a company called Create, okay? And they have creatine gummies that are single one gram gummies of creatine monohydrate. One of the issues I have with creatine a lot of times is if you take like five grams or 10 grams in one sitting, you do retain a lot more water. But what I've found is that if you take one gram different times throughout the day, it attenuates that water retention markedly. And there's research to back that up. Creatine is amazing when it comes down to endurance work, when it comes down to anaerobic performance, when it comes down to power, when it comes down to recovery, even potentially neuroinflammation. And create is all about destigmatizing creatine because women need it, men need it, power athletes need it, endurance athletes need it, people that use their brain a lot need it. So I highly recommend, and that link down below is gonna save you 15% off 
not only are they effective, they also taste really good, and you can throttle your dosage appropriately, not trying to like measure white powder in the perfect amount and also get busted by TSA for having mysterious white powders in your bag, and you know the drill. So having gummies just makes it easy to dose appropriately. So I put that link down below in the description, just beneath this video, check them out, it's called Create. You won't be disappointed. I recommend just doing like two or three grams to start and then increase how you feel. What about resistance training? So many people are gonna tell you you need to be fed like to get power and to get that performance and to get that muscle growth. Hmm, I don't know, let's look at the data again. There's a study in the Journal of Science and Sports and Medicine looked at fasted training versus fed training in power athletes. They found no difference between the two. So this study looked at power athletes in a fasted state or a fed state during Ramadan, which is interesting, so periods where they would like, be fasted or have a lot more fuel. There was no difference in power. There was no difference there, whether they were fasted or fed. You know what did make a big difference? Was how much fuel they had the day before, how hydrated they were, how they slept. These were the factors. So it didn't really matter in the case of power if they ate before the workout or not, as long as they had enough fuel essentially the day before. Their onboard fuel was much more important, significant, pretty much entirely more important than whether they fueled right before the workout. So knowing this, it's like, hmm, it doesn't really matter. I mean, you could put yourself in a gray area where like, okay, well, I'm trying to go for a maximum lift and I'm trying to like get this maximum number on the scoreboard. And then it might make sense, you know, because then you, your recovery comes into play. Or if you're doing like CrossFit style where you're really bridging that aerobic and that anaerobic where, yeah, having some carbs might actually fuel you through those higher, longer intensity, like longer duration endurance moves that are like weaved in to your training. But if you're just going to the gym as a bro, it's kind of not, like, it doesn't really matter. But let's look at fat oxidation because the question is still gonna come up, what's better for fat loss? So with this, we look at a study published in the British Journal of Nutrition. Took a look at 27 studies. Again, not small data, like good legit data. They found that in a fasted state, it was not just a small difference, but a monumentally significant difference in fat oxidation. Much more fat oxidation in a fasted state versus a fed state. So what's the deal here? Well, I think we just answered our own question if we think about the previous study too. Power, capacity, didn't, no, that, that didn't change, right? So that assumes that you can essentially burn the same amount of calories, fasted or fed, in your resistance training, but fasted training is gonna oxidize more fat. If you burn 1,000 calories and I burn 1,000 calories and I'm burning 50% fat and you're burning 20% fat, uh, who's gonna burn more absolute fat? Do the math, I would, right? So with this case, it comes down to body composition. You need to periodize your training appropriately. Body composition, fat loss phases, power phases. Body composition, power, right? You need to throttle it back and forth. Let's come right back to this weighted vest analogy. Let's say I come into the gym and I throw a 20 pound weight vest on and I do a bunch of pull-ups. Might only get 10 pull-ups. 15 pull-ups, right? But the adaptation that I signaled is going to be, hey, this guy needs to get stronger because he's lifting more than his body weight. The person next to me is just doing like 20 reps with their body weight. Okay, I might get a better adaptation so that when I ditch the weight vest, wow, my body weight feels like feathers. The same thing for your training. Mitochondrial adaptation VO2 max adaptation, as demonstrated in these other studies. You're getting a greater leap and adaptation so that when it does come time to fuel, you're gonna be like fueling a machine that is highly efficient. Another analogy would be like, let's say you drive around in a Ferrari and you're putting like, you know, friggin' 89 octane in like low quality gas, okay, or 87, or depending where you are, 85, right? driving around in that sucker and the Ferrari's just like put, 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 put. You're not creating efficiency in the Ferrari. That's the only difference. But then all of a sudden you're used to driving it like that. Then you go to the track and you get some 110 octane and you're like, whoa, holy crap, this is a different car. No, you just have a more efficient fuel. That's kind of the same sort of thing. You've adapted yourself. You've created more mitochondrial density so that when you do fuel it, there's more engines, right? So there is 
no right or wrong way with this. Now, if we want to get scientific, essentially when you're fed, you're inhibiting lipolysis, you're inhibiting some of these actions that stop the adaptation, okay? Now, in a fed state, you could arguably get more progressive overload because you maybe have a little bit more strength. So here's what I recommend as a takeaway because I know this ends up being kind of even-sided. You need to periodize your training and you need to periodize how you eat before your training or not eat just like you would anything else. So what I do personally is I will do periods where I train fasted and then with no lead up whatsoever, I will train fed. And you know what? A lot of times I will tell you my lifts and my wattage is higher. And it's easy to fall victim to saying like, well, shoot, am I chasing numbers on the scoreboard and I want that? You know, sometimes for my ego, I do. But I also remember that I check my ego at the door and I'm much more interested in an adaptation. Because I'll tell you what, if I train and I can only deadlift 315 for X number of reps in a fasted state, and then comes the day where I'm appropriately fed, I might be deadlifting 405 for the same amount of reps. Sometimes, by triggering that adaptation, when you do fuel, it's a monumental difference. You need to check your ego at the door and realize that it's okay to occasionally train fasted. And you're also not completely going to blow it all away and not burn fat if you train, train fed, right? Like, so being able to know when and where and to throttle it appropriately, put that stuff down on a dang piece of paper. Tomorrow is a fasted training day. The next day is a fed training day. Drop the ego at the door and get some results. I'll see you tomorrow.